World Development Report 2014. Risk and Opportunity. Innovations in Social Insurance with Francisco Ferreira, Chief Economist for Africa Region, World Bank. So previous speakers in this course told you about how households and communities are the first and second line of defense against risks, right, in protecting people from risks, things like the risk of unemployment, uh, health risks, uh, f weather related risks. Of course, we all know that we typically rely primarily, first of all, when something like that hits us, we rely on our families, you know, on your spouse, on your parents, later on in life, even on your um, adult children. Um, but there's a limitation to how much uh, households and communities can do, in part because households are small and the same shock can hit, uh, can hit everyone in a household. So if you're a, a, a poor farmer uh, in uh, Mali, for example, uh, and there's a drought, you know, the drought affects uh, the plots of everyone in the household, and it's not much that one partner can do for the other one. Um, or if there's a natural disaster uh, and, you know, there's a flood or an earthquake, then everyone in the household is hit by the same shock. Even labor market shocks like unemployment can affect whole regions together. And those kinds of um, correlations between the risk faced by individuals in a household or even a broader community create a limitation for how effective uh, the household and the community can be in protecting against, uh, against shock. So they're, they're hugely important, but they need to be complemented. And in economic theory, we think that the main mechanism to complement uh, local insurance uh, amongst household members or community members is provided by the market, right? There's a market for insurance, so people buy car insurance, health insurance. You could even buy, in some places, uh, insurance against unemployment. But the markets don't do the whole job either, particularly in developing countries. Economists talk about problems with insurance markets that have uh, interesting names like moral hazard or adverse selection. And what they mean is that insurance markets are peculiar in the sense that um, people who are likely to look for the insurance market are actually the highest risk people themselves. If I'm a really bad driver, I'll go buy a car insurance faster than somebody who's very confident of being a good driver. Um, we recently in the United States have looked at how in expanding healthcare, for example, the government was very keen to encourage young people who are typically healthier to enroll in order in part to deal with this issue of adverse selection, of the fact that insurance markets attract higher risk individuals. Moral hazard, on the other hand, has to do with the fact that maybe the fact that you buy insurance makes you behave in a riskier way. Yeah? Uh, so much is written about, so maybe if I buy a really good health insurance, I drive less carefully, I'm not sure, that's a possibility, right? So what happens is that because of these problems, insurance markets aren't as widespread and as accessible as we would like. Uh, insurance markets are underprovided typically. They're not like rice markets or, uh, or, 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 or markets for, for cars. They're markets uh, which are much more problematic. Uh, in particular in developing countries, um, they are developing more slowly and, and only more recently uh, and aren't accessible to everybody. So because households and communities can't do the whole job and markets under provide insurance, there has long been a role for the public sector, there has long been a role for governments in the, provide, in the provision of what's called uh, social insurance. In a sense it goes back to Bismarck in Germany and Beveridge in England. Uh, you know, centuries, more than a century ago, uh, and they created instruments that we're now all familiar with, like uh, unemployment insurance, old age pensions, disability pensions, and soon thereafter, unemployment insurance. So these kinds of state-provided mechanisms to dealing with, with shocks, with risks, um, have long been with us in, in the developed world. In developing economies, they are also present and have been present for 40 to 50 years uh, in places like Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Brazil. Um, but in many other countries, the peculiarities of the developing economies themselves, in particular the fact that there's often a lot of informality, 
um, you know, formal employment accounts for a lower proportion of the labor force than it, than it does in, 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 in richer countries, created problems for some of the modalities of developed country uh, social protection mechanisms, again, like health insurance and, and, and unemployment insurance and so on. So um, as a result, new mechanisms developed, new, new social protection uh, s systems developed, things like public employment guarantees. So a very famous one, a very famous example now is NREGA in India, right? The National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. That's a great mechanism for dealing with risk because it's a publicly guaranteed offer of work Right? If, if you want, you can go there and get a job, you know, repairing a road or working on an irrigation ditch. But it's a, provided at a, at a wage that's low enough that normally farmers would prefer to farm their own field than to, than to uh, avail themselves of that possibility. But um, if things go really wrong, if, if the crop fails, if there's a terrible drought or some other uh, covariate shock like that hits the whole community, people have access to that, uh, to that uh, public employment opportunity at least to maintain a minimum level of, of livelihood. Um, another uh, recent development uh, in developing countries in terms of social protection that, that's captured a lot of attention in the imagination of many people are conditional cash transfers. So these are transfers you know, that began in Brazil in, in, in the mid-90s, uh, uh, created originally in, in a few cities like Brasilia and Campinas, and uh, were then uh, introduced in Mexico in 1997, 1998, under the name of Progresa, uh, what is now known as the Oportunidades Program. And here what happens is that the state will make targeted cash transfers to the household, typically the woman, the mother in the household, provided their children are enrolled uh, in school and in some cases also follow some health and nutrition conditions like vaccinations or the mothers attending some uh, hygiene and nutrition classes, for example. Uh, these programs were, were not really developed originally, conceived of initially as programs to deal with risk. Um, if, because they're, in fact, you know, it's, it's intended that the beneficiaries will keep their kids in school for the whole school year at least. So they're not really short-term uh, mechanisms for dealing with risk in the same way that the public employment guarantee schemes were. But they ended up also being used to mitigate risk for two reasons. First of all, they, uh, they provide uh, a steady flow of income. So that if you, know, you lose your job or again, there's some problem with the crop or, or, or some economic de depression that affects your wages, the family is receiving at least that minimum level of support. And for another reason that, that has been found more recently in some cases, for example, in Tanzania, uh, there, was a Tanzanian, there is a Tanzanian social fund, TASAF, that created a pilot conditional cash transfer scheme three or four years ago. And in a study of that pilot, uh, some uh, uh, researchers have found that actually one of the things households buy more of with that money is health insurance. There's a market for basic health insurance in uh, uh, in Tanzania, and uh, the the households exposed to this to this uh, treatment to the to the cash transfer uh, treatment actually buy health insurance a lot more often uh, than those in the control group that didn't benefit from the policy. So basically, the uh, the cash transfer not only provides a floor of income that already reduces downside risks, but in addition, it allows the household to participate in markets uh, to buy private insurance in, in where that previously didn't happen. So conditional cash transfers can also act uh, as, as a risk, uh, risk management device. So there's a huge role for public action in dealing with risk because uh, risks are covariate, households and communities are important, they're the first line of defense, but they're not enough. And public employment schemes and conditional cash transfers are a good example of how the state has been developing innovative ways of doing that in developing countries. Thank you.